Hi everyone and welcome back to the George Collection. I'm Rachel with Right Side Blonde. Today I'm bringing back a magazine I've highlighted once before in episode 16 and that is the March of 1999 issue, the Lights, Camera, Politics issue. If you haven't seen that episode yet, I encourage you to go back and watch it. This second time going through this magazine, I wanted to highlight the interview that John Kennedy had with Mike McCurry, who was Clinton's press secretary. He's giving some incredible insights on being a press secretary and, and press in general. So here we go. One often wonders, given all that has happened in the last 14 months, how President Clinton could get out of bed every morning and go to work. But the real question is, how in the world did White House Press Secretary Mike McCurry do it? Day after day, he was the one who had to stand on the podium and face the pack of White House reporters while Bill Clinton could take refuge from journalists behind the velvet rope. McCurry's ability to remain credible while presenting the administration's version of events and still retain a wicked sense of humor made him, in the eyes of many, the best press secretary in decades. When McCurry left for the private sector last October, he received nearly as many accolades from the media as he did when he was appointed. Still, some in the administration grumbled that he was too close to the press and not fierce enough in his defense of the president. McCurry's own recent comments about the president and Monica Lewinsky have not endeared him to the Clinton inner circle. Spinning scandal is familiar ground to the 44-year-old McCurry. After graduating from Princeton in 1976, he landed a job as press secretary for New Jersey Senator Harrison Williams, who was soon ensnared in the FBI's abscam investigation, and it fell to the 25-year-old press secretary to call his boss at home and alert him that the next day's headlines would effectively end his political career. In the years after Williams' conviction, McCurry worked for a series of Democratic presidential candidates. As the spokesman for Nebraska Senator Bob Kerry during his 1992 effort, McCurry openly questioned whether the frontrunner Bill Clinton was honest enough for the office. Clinton nonetheless tapped McCurry in 1993 to be his State Department spokesman. Two years later, McCurry replaced Dee Dee Myers as the president's press secretary, and the White House's rocky relations with the media improved almost overnight. Since leaving government, McCurry has clearly been enjoying his newfound celebrity. He's a much sought after speaker on the lecture circuit. He gave a widely quoted interview with the BBC, and he was recently feted at Michael's, the eatery of choice for New York's media glitterati. In addition, he has embarked on a public relations career at Public Strategies, a Washington firm just a few blocks from his old job. In conversation, McCurry is disarmingly candid and clearly relishes the chance to speak not for an administration, but for himself. John Kennedy asks, we've all watched you tussling with reporters at the daily press briefings, but what exactly is the job of the presidential press secretary? Mike replies, the role of press secretary is easiest to understand by simply looking at the geography of the White House. The press secretary's office is in the West Wing, and when you walk out of it and turn right, 50 feet away, you're in the Oval Office. But if you turn left, 50 feet away, you're in the briefing room. So the press secretary is equidistance from these two institutions, Institutions that are in an increasingly adversarial and acrimonious relationship. The press secretary is there to explain one side of the equation to the other, and then to try to balance out the interests. John says, so your attention is constantly shifting back and forth. And Mike replies, right. I believe that blind loyalty to either one is ineffective. Some spokesmen got too close to the press or were too blindly loyal to the president and couldn't do their job effectively. You have to try to keep everyone satisfied. John asks, which of your predecessors did you not want to emulate? And Mike replies, obviously in the last year, the one thing I wanted to avoid was recreating the role that Ron Ziegler fell into when he had to become the public voice of denial on behalf of the Nixon White House. And as you probably know, I said last year that being out of the loop at times and always relying on what lawyers were telling me made it impossible for me to go out to the podium and compound the lie that the president acknowledged telling. I took a lot of criticism for that quote. John said, in what way? Mike replied, Nat Hentoff wrote a pretty stiff piece in the Washington Post saying, hey, look at all these journalists who thought Mike McCurry was a nice guy, but in fact, he failed us because he was proud that he didn't get the information necessary to respond to the questions from the press. Well, that's a legitimate criticism. I would have to fault myself for that too. Still, the alternative would have been to go out and disseminate erroneous information because the president was obviously in denial and concealing his affair. Then you would have had Mike McCurry out there compounding the lie that Bill Clinton was telling his wife, his staff, and his closest friends. 
John asks, what are the immediate consequences of a press secretary who's seen as being too protective of the president? Mike replies, that's a good question. There are no immediate consequences for the American people because they will continue to hear the unfiltered line of the day from the White House and then hear all the critics respond to it. But in the long run, you'll wind up eroding the relationship of trust and credibility that you must have with the press corps. And without that, you can't do business day in and day out. There's a real sulfurous atmosphere in that briefing room when the press doesn't like dealing with you, when they don't trust you. Once they think you're a liar, the relationship deteriorates. John asks, did you ever get fed up with certain members of the press? Did you ever just get mad? Mike says, oh sure, I got mad. I felt considerable anger. I mean, I think the press hijacked the country when they took over the Lewinsky story last year in January. They put it way out of proportion, way too quickly, and then never figured out how to climb back from that precipice. You know, within the first couple of days, they went right up to the edge saying that this was going to destroy the presidency, and they never got off that quest. Sure, I had my own personal frustration and resentment about that, but you just can't let that infect a relationship that is already acrimonious. John says, You've said that young reporters are among the most cynical in the press corps. Why? Mike replies, because they've never known gallantry in journalism. There's no sense there that journalism is a craft that can be practiced, that can elevate discourse, illuminate, strip naked the powerful. What worries me is that journalism no longer carries a reward for the practice of elegant, fruitful reporting that helps people understand things. Today, the rewards go to people who spend their time analyzing and judging and speculating on someone's motives and even becoming a little sneering about it all. John says, you weren't above a partisan shot every now and then, were you? Mike replies, I could be a pretty political guy. I remember Marlon Fitzwater once telling me, as long as you think there's mileage in taking on the opposition party in Congress, there usually isn't. If you find yourself talking about the majority leader or the speaker too much, you'll probably regret it. And he's right. John asks, do you think public officials will ever be able to claim their personal lives for themselves again? And Mike replies, the pendulum is going to shift. Some privacy rights will return for our public figures. Things are going to calm down. The press, to its credit, already made an effort to do this with Chelsea Clinton. I'm sure this is something you can appreciate. I mean, Chelsea had an experience as a child in the White House that is totally different from what other presidential children have gone through. She grew up in the White House and turned into a pretty good kid. Have you ever spent any time with her? John said, yes, she's an impressive young woman. Mike replies, in my opinion, she has her head screwed on a little bit better than her mom and dad in many ways. Maybe the legacy of the Clinton White House will actually be a positive one, one that reminds us that we can create a zone of privacy and that it's not necessarily a bad thing to sometimes let people lead their lives without intruding on them. John asks, how has the experience of the last year changed you? And Mike replies, I'm still too fresh out of it to really have much perspective on it. I feel kind of guilty because I labored pretty anonymously most of the time I was in the White House, but doing the live briefings toward the end, frankly, I have benefited from that. My family has benefited from that. I will now make more money giving speeches because of it and because I've been tested at that level. The whole experience leaves me feeling ambivalent. I guess I'll always wonder what it would have been like to work for Bill Clinton if he had a normal presidency. Would we have achieved all the great goals that he talked about in the last election? Would we have been able to outfox the Republicans and get more of his agenda accomplished? I don't want to imply that the president doesn't have the capacity to do all that in the next two years, but I think it's going to be hard. As for me, I feel proud of the job I did. I think I tried to do a good job under rotten circumstances. I really like that article because it gave an insider view of what the press secretary does and what they go through. I can't imagine the pressure that they feel, especially in circumstances like what Bill Clinton had and what Kayleigh McEnany had to go through with President Trump. I particularly liked Mike's comments about the press. That does it for this week's episode of The George Collection. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week and I'll see you next time. Magazine, George, which is a hoot of a magazine. I thought you were a lawyer. I was. What happened? Well, we, uh, we decided, I mean, actually taking a cue from, from folks like yourself and you around the 1992 election, that, that there was an opportunity here to uh, change the definition of a political magazine. Uh, certainly the way Americans were uh, accessing information about politics and politicians was changing. Uh, candidates were appearing on late night talk shows, on talk radio, on sitcoms. Uh, 
and there was a, a kind of a leveling process and while the rest of media clearly had caught up with that we felt that political magazines per se hadn't your mother was a hell of an editor at Doubleday that's what I hear would she have liked George I think she would have